historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home for the diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples of the Montreal community. I'd like to acknowledge today the always welcome presence of William Flock, Assistant Secretary for Relations with English-speaking Quebecers, Permettez-moi de présenter, je m'appelle Brian Lewis, je suis professeur dans le département de communication à l'Université Concordia. Bienvenue à ce forum pour intituler la vitalité des communautés minoritaires par l'éducation. Pour une troisième journée, aujourd'hui, nous explorons ensemble comment le développement de l'éducation pour les minorités linguistiques de contribuer à la vitalité des communautés. Le forum portera une attention particulière à la minorité anglophone du Québec. Cet événement a été organisé par le réseau de recherche sur les communautés québécoises d'expression anglaise, Request Group, en collaboration avec sa table d'éducation Interall pour IBET. Avec le euh, docteur Chelly Koja, je suis co-directeur de Presco. Permettez-moi de souligner le travail du comité du programme de cet événement. Les noms des membres du, du comité sont indiqués sur votre programme, dans votre programme. Il s'agit d'une douzaine de personnes représentant les écoles, les cégep, les universités et les groupes communautaires, desservant la population d'expression anglaise du Québec. Quel excellent exemple du type de collaboration que notre communauté peut mobiliser. Thanks to Dr. Lorraine O'Donnell, the Concordia University Chair of the Forum Program Committee, for her leadership in this important initiative. I also want to, I want to underline the work of the Question staff who effectively brought their many skills together to organize this event. Dr. Patrick Donovan, who is also a former forum program committee member, as well as Anna Gomez, Aurelia Roman, and Anna Hobbs. As you can see, we're viewing the program of three-day forum features, activities that address Quebec's English-speaking communities and all their diversity. We're very proud of this. At the forum, our speakers from or representing different regions, different ethnic cultural groups, different immigrant status, and different socioeconomic groups. We've also been very pleased to have indigenous people from Kanawake, the Sioux, and the Ujavik speaking at our forum. Also, we're very, very grateful to our partners who have offered financial support for this event. They include the Secretariat for Relations with English People Quebecers, from the Monde de Quebec, Canadian Heritage, Government of Canada, the Ministère de l'Education and Enseignement Supérieur, or Concordia University, the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities. Villarreal, Bishop's University, and the Quebec Community Groups Network. Our program today, as the other days, is very rich. After the keynote address, which I'll introduce in a minute, and a coffee break, we'll have four concurrent panels. The afternoon includes three exciting workshops that you're welcome to attend, but you have to choose one because they are concurrent as well. The fourth workshop is by invitation. And I want to say a word about it. It brings together Questquin's research members, researcher members, to start developing joint research projects on community priority topics. So this is a workshop which is looking towards future projects, basically involving researchers. Our research members come from Quebec, the rest of Canada, and abroad, including the UK, Brazil, and Japan. If you are a researcher and would like to join the group, please contact Questquin. Contact Romain O'Donnell or Patrick Donovan. It's, I don't think it's too late to join the workshop this afternoon. The final event of the day and of the forum is a town hall. Dr. Marie Jose Berger, a member of our inter level table for Bishop's University, will lead us in a wrap up discussion about the three days of our forum. 
as you've seen in the program, the forum's overall goal is to encourage mobilization around the development of a healthy and sustainable English language education offered in Quebec from pre-K to university. That leads to student retention, access to good jobs in Quebec, and a strong sense of identity and belonging. Post-university, I should add as well. In particular, the forum is aimed to promote and support a meaningful continuum in the English language educational offering in the province, which is of great concern to the government as well as to us. <coughs> this will ensure that English-speaking young people and adults can have access, and know they have access, to education in their language throughout the lifelong learning cycle. This notion of a continuum of education is strongly supported by all of our partners. We hope at the end of today you'll agree that we've achieved certain specific goals that we had set out to achieve. These include increased awareness of the education system's role in building community and identity, new opportunities to network and collaborate, knowledge of community socioeconomic realities, including poverty, and networks and resources that can be mobilized to address them. So I wish you all a productive day of learning and discussing. Je vous souhaite une journée intéressante, pertinente et productive. It's a really great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for today, Dr. Kate Lemaitre. Kate Lemaitre has a master's in education and a PhD from the Yale University. She works as a teacher, a university professor, a researcher, and an administrator. Dr. Lemaitre has taught pre-service and in-service teachers, and her special interests include the design of instruction, mathematics and science education, expert teachers, and the growth of teachers from novice to expert, especially through mentoring and induction. Since 2007, Dr. Lemaitre has served as chair of the advisory board on English education for Quebec. This group advises the Minister of Education and other agencies in education in the English sector of Quebec. <coughs> Kate indicated in her biography that she has, quote, grown to recognize that Quebec's English speakers constitute a collection of diverse communities, having language as a common bond, and that she continues to work in maintaining and promoting English language education in Quebec. This is overly modest. Kate Lemaitre, Lemaitre is a recognized leader for Quebec's English language education system. We are delighted that she accepted our invitation to be our keynote speaker today. And the provocative title of her talk is The English Language School System of Quebec. Who cares? Thank you. Yeah, I chose the title of this to be a little bit provocative, obviously, but if you're sitting on the edge of your seats, um, waiting for my answer to the question, I'll put you out of your agony right now and say, yes, I care very much. Um, I venture to say, if you're attending this forum, you care too. So in that sense, I'm preaching to the choir, I know that. But uh, bear with me while I try and pull together some of the things that we've heard and try and extend them a little bit. I, I'll be repetitive, I'm sure, because we've all been to different sessions. I've been very excited by the, um, the sessions I've been to. Um, I, I, there's so much going on. I mean, it's, it's hard to put it all together. Um, Brian mentioned the Advisory Board on English Education. Um, we produce a brief to the Minister of Education at least one a year, and there's some members of the board here today that you can talk to and past members. And they'll keep me honest, I know, although I will say that you're going to hear what I think, not the board policy. Uh, you can pick up some copies of our this year's brief outside if you, if you choose. So, let's find the right arrow. What is an English school in Quebec? Uh, this is a picture of a school near Norton. It closed about uh, uh, 50 years ago. It's a small school, as you can tell. It's now, now a museum. And I looked at that and thought, well, we don't have schools like that anymore. They tend to look more like this. And I stole this from uh, uh, Sunday's presentation by Craig Olenek. Uh, this is James Lynn High School with its, its lovely murals. But then I thought, well, yeah, in some areas of Quebec, schools still look like the little one in Lopen not look like it physically, but have the same kind of student population. A very small school, small student population. The difference is that this would have been an English Protestant school in the townships, and not, they don't exist anymore, as we know. Um, they don't exist, but 
uh, children in, in Quebec are going to get a good education regardless of whether they go to a French school or an English school. But there are differences between the, the two systems. <clears throat> this is where I start generalizing, as you, as you realize. The English school is a hub of the community, often the last one, the last remaining English one. Uh, it offers bilingual education. It's unique in Quebec in that sense. It often offers other uh, languages as well. So we, we're looking at this multilingual uh, um, uh, face to the, uh, the province. There's a close focus on the child and the child's needs. It prepares students for the, the larger world. It belongs to a system of nine boards, but it extends beyond that because these boards cooperate, they share uh, expertise, they give opportunities for teachers to engage in professional development together. Um, one of the sister groups of the advisory board is the LCEQ, the Community for English Education in Quebec, and they do a tremendous job of, uh, of professional development initiatives with professional development initiatives. <laughs> Um, distance education, because of the uh, demographics, because we're so small and so diffuse in the province, distance education has become an issue and is very successful. Traditions and culture, I'll come back to that in, in a bit, but it accepts diversity, the English school uh, system in Quebec. It's open to change, it's inclusive, 90% of children with special needs are included in mainstream classes, whatever that means these days. Uh, it's successful. Uh, again, we have a graduation rate that's the envy of lots of places, but it's at least 80% in most areas, despite the load of learning in two languages at the same time. Sense of belonging and parental involvement. And um, it was David McFall on Sunday who said that um, French-speaking parents who transferred their children to his school talked about it as being a welcoming school. I think that's a lovely phrase, the idea of a welcoming school. Uh, somebody said last year that if on any one day you can expect to find a thousand volunteers in, an English, uh, in English schools. That's a big number for a small number of schools. And a lot of the credit of that goes to uh, Quebec Federation of Home Schools, uh, who've been in existence 99 years, apparently. But it's an endangered school because of demographic uh, decline, and we've heard a lot about that. One more little description of the English school. The advisory board wrote in 1992, this is some of my slides are a bit dense, so forgive me if I put them up line by line. Actually, this is 1999, I'm sorry, I got my quotations right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the notion of listening to the radio or reading newspapers might sound a bit quaint these days, but uh, you get the sense of it, uh, I know. And because of this cultural and demographic mix, it's sometimes hard to say, well, what is an English school? I found this, uh, this map quite interesting. This is the um, two biggest English language school boards in the province, I think I'm right on that. And if you look at the English Montreal school board schools, they have four, I think it's four identified in blue there, which they call English schools. There are a few in English and immersion, and the rest are all either bilingual or immersion. And I think the boundary, can I, I don't know, yes I do. No, it doesn't show. Okay, the boundary between the two school boards, you can see it there, and if you look at the Lester B. Pearson schools, they're all either bilingual or immersion. So, so what's an English school? I leave the question floating there. But these two schools are among the highest achieving in the province with regard to uh, retention rates and graduation rates. So they're, they're doing something, something right. Again, in several, in two languages, possibly more. 
In the regions, the home language of the majority of students may be French. And so there's less French em emphasis on French perhaps in the school and more on English. Um, we had a, an advisory board member a few years ago from the North Shore in a school of 38 children from K to secondary two. And 37 of the families were French speaking. And then the father of the last English family got transferred to Quebec City. And so there were no, and, and then there were nuns, the nursery rhyme says. So it's, it's a bit, um, it's quite interesting when you, you try and define what we're talking about. So what does the system contribute to Quebec? Well, the main thing, I suppose, is the bilingual education. Um, English language school boards have responded to the parents' requests and pleas for more and more French. Um, but one suburban Montreal board reports that parents want more French to the end of grade eight. And then after that, to grades nine, 10, and 11, they want more English, all right? to prove the grades of the students writing in their home, their, their mother tongue, uh, because Seja is on the horizon. Uh, this, this is interesting, this is a little bit of a, a diversion, but I was really interested in the study that was, the Seja study that was done on uh, the, the students' ability to function in French. Um, the study showed that students from the English sector can get a DEC, a Diploma of Collegial Studies, without attaining a sufficient level of French to be able to work in the language. And like all interesting research, of course, this opens up more questions than it answers. So I dusted off my old academic hat and tried to put this research alongside other research that, that seems to be contradictory. You know, the Stats Canada figures are that 82% of these young people are bilingual. Maybe that's an exaggeration. Uh, we can all claim to be something and tell the Stats Can Review we may not be telling the complete truth. However, this big, big gap there between 82% or 75% or 70% and more than half not being able to function. So I found that kind of interesting. Um, I found some, some figures from about the time that the SEJEP study was carried out. I can, I just took out four school boards on the same territory, so that we're comparing apples with apples demographically. We've got the English Montreal board, that's to be Pearson, compared with the two French boards on the same territory. And if you look at the marks there, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, this is 2013, so I think it's a, I think these students might have been the ones who would have then gone to Seja and begin the study, and they would have gone to probably uh, John Abbott, Dawson, and Vanier, where most of the students in the study were studying. There, there are more recent results from this past year. Yeah, I think I think that uh, somebody from Leicester Beacon would correct me, but I suspect that's a very small and very select group. But even so, it's English Montreal Board, 90%. But a note, please, this is French language of instruction, not FSL. So these are the people in their French students studying in their own tongue. And the history and citizenship would have been the Histoire exam, which again would have been written in French. Those are pretty good results. So what happens to these kids? Where are they going? Where are these high achieving students going? These are, these are the stars. These are the ones who are going on to Seja, right? Um, do they, have they chosen French Seigeps? Have they gone not to Dawson, but to one of the French Seigeps? Um, how, how can they be so good in high school and so bad at the end of Seigeps? I can't understand this. I, I really, I'm, I'm interested, I'm curious. What's the quality of French of the students in Seja if they're not getting as good marks as, as some of these others? Um, this, is, this, is, um, this is kind of interesting. There's a lot more at play here. The researchers did say that um, um, they had stories of students who deliberately do, well, uh, do badly in the placement tests 
so that they can be put into lower level classes and get better marks and a better quarter score. I mean, these youngsters are not stupid, right? I mean, these are smart kids. <laughs> they also said that um, they weren't motivated to learn French because it was being forced on them, it was being forced down their throats. Well, the English course in Sejab is compulsory too. How did they feel about the English course? Did they feel that was being shoved down their throats? Interesting, lots of good questions here. I'm, uh, I got quite excited about this research because it also uh, supports several other studies. 2009, the Youth Standing Committee of QCGN um, wrote a report called Creating Spaces for Young Quebecers. It, it surveyed 300 English speakers between 16 and 29 years of age. And I recommend this to you if you, if you, if you don't already know it. It's, there's some really interesting stuff in there too. Many of the people, the young people that they interviewed um, expressed a lack of confidence in speaking French. And um, early this year, there was a Journal de Montréal study. Uh, now, I, I will say, I don't usually use the Journal for my um, research data, but um, <laughs> you'll be relieved on game, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it, it did really hit the press, and so there are a few things in there that I thought were worth, uh, worth recording. There's the lack of confidence And I can relate to that. <laughs> I'm speaking French with this accent, boy, you again clear room. So, English schools, what are they contributing? Well, the other um, thing that I mentioned right in the, the beginning there was the transmission of culture and heritage. And this is a tricky one, because the mandate of French language schools in the rest of Canada is transmission of and preservation of culture and heritage. That's not the mission of English language schools in Quebec. Far from it. The mission is to prepare young people to function in Quebec society. If it does promote and protect culture and heritage, all to the good. But that's not the mission of the school. And that, I think, is worth remembering <clears throat> as a comparison when we start looking at the, um, the situations in other provinces. And, and, and we, you know, we might ask, given this diversity of cultures and heritages in the schools, whose culture, whose heritage should we be promoting, preserving, and protecting? Um, we, we've gone through controversy lately about the high school history course, and the, um, the answer for the people who wrote that is fairly clear. It's the, the, the majority culture and the majority heritage. Um, I, again, I went back to, this would be really interesting, because I've been going back to some old data. I know it's back in the dark ages, but 1999 isn't that long ago. The advisory board uh, wrote a brief on culture and English schools in play. Paul Ashospey, you will probably remember, was the um, chair of the very important committee that looked at curriculum <coughs> review some years ago. I thought that was very open-minded. I leave that comment floating again. The, in the report, the advisory board also quoted a provincial ex a committee that existed at that time. It was called um, Culture and Education, a Committed Partnership. And I was interested in the two ministers who had signed the report. Uh, there was a committee that came from this, and the Abbey suggested that the committee should explore ways, etc. And the chair of this committee was uh, Monsieur Persoir Le Gouk. <laughs> Last year's advisory board brief um, addressed issues relating to indigenous people in Quebec. Uh, we, we weren't trying to say, do this and you'll be fine. But what we did do was look at some of the <coughs> things that we'd learned in the English sector that might be interesting to, to consider as the indigenous people, A, change their curriculum, and as the southern schools teach about indigenous issues. So there was you know, two problems there. 
um, we found that the, the problems that were faced in the indigenous communities were very similar to what we were facing, but magnified, enlarged, and in spades. Um, just a few things that we wrote. This is uh, cherry picked some of the things that, that we wrote there. <coughs> You go to somewhere like Val d'Or and you're talking about remoteness and inaccessibility, cost. We are becoming concerned, I think, in the English-speaking community, or some people, about loss of identity. And again, the question was raised, Yesterday, I guess, why, or, or the day before, I can't remember. Um, why do you want to keep them here? Why don't you educate them so that they can move? Uh, it, uh, to me, that isn't the issue. The issue is educate them so that they have the choice. They have choice. Do they want to stay? Do they want to move? Um, to me, it's, it's much more important to have that breadth of education um, and then the, the youngsters do what they do, and they become successful, and there we go. And I think when we talk about the elders in the indigenous communities, we talk about community in general here, and the influence that um, um, community should have. So I'm talk this goes two ways, right? The school and the community, and the community and the school, and that keeps on coming up in our deliberations. Um, as far as the community involvement goes, I can see Debbie Horrex is here, and, and again, I'll mention that 85 now, Debbie, schools, 86, I'm out of date again, um, 86 English language schools in Quebec have community learning centers, which provide an, an amazing service for adults and children to get together, to learn from each other and with each other. And they exist only in the English sector, and they have been a success story and continue to be so to um, preserve community vitality. In the small communities where English language services and institutions have atrophied or even disappeared, the school is even more often the last remaining institution for English speaking population and the last opportunity to preserve and promote English speaking cultural heritage. So we're adding another load onto the school. The school is the hub of the community, given the loss of churches, community centers, post offices, banks, even ATMs are disappearing from some rural communities. And if the ATM goes, they're really in trouble, right? If the English language school goes, the young parents go with their children. And if the young families go, the community that might have been established several hundred years ago uh, uh, doesn't survive. Um, successes and innovations in the English sector have made a, a contribution to Quebec as a whole. The, the governance in the English school sector is flatter, it's less hierarchical, there's more grassroots, ground up uh, work being done. They felt more free to experiment and to initiate teaching strategies to benefit the students rather than, than in, in doing top down, uh, using top down solutions. And of course, the classic example is the St. Lambert project to teach a second language through immersion. This is caught on throughout the world, regrettably not in the rest of Quebec, but there we are. Some, some examples have transferred, though, and we can, some of you know more about those than I do. I believe we can make the case that Quebec is strengthened by a vigorous and creative English language education system. And one that's worth preserving. Um, perceptions. Perceptions are often more influential than reality. I don't want to get political here, and I just keep thinking of things that are happening in our neighboring, uh, neighboring territories. But I think two perceptions are important in the context that we're talking about um, today and tomorrow. First of all, um, yes, Anglophone youth are more bilingual than their elders or than their French peers, but they're more likely to be unemployed and they're more likely to be living <coughs> below the poverty line. 
It's also true that bilingual English speakers are more likely to be unemployed, goes along with the, the uh, salary. And there, the, 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 I think the ranking is, and Bill, you can keep me honest here, um, the, the <coughs> Francophone um, population has the lowest level of unemployment. Bilingual Anglophones, monolingual Anglophones, monolingual black, Anglopho uh, black uh, population, or immigrant allophone population. Is that about right? In, in general terms. In the QCGN um, study, Grading Spaces, that I mentioned, most of the youth that were surveyed expressed frustration in attempting to integrate into the job market. In addition to the language barrier, many felt that English speakers faced discrimination in accessing jobs or in realizing upward mobility. And we keep hearing, yes, and they don't get jobs in the public sector. So the Journal de Montréal, again, she figured that her English surname prevented her from getting a call for interviews. This is her perception, I know, but it's one that we hear over and over. Some of the respondents um, felt shy about joining social groups, activities in French. They were concerned about social tensions due to language, their feelings of being unwelcome or deterred by the stress on speaking French. And finally, from the journal, This, this was conducted at the time of the Bonjour High fiasco. I should have said that. So they said quite blithely that a lot of young people were saying au revoir, bye. I think this was exaggerated a little bit, but anyway. Because, again, the QCGN poll showed this. A lot of young people are willing to stay and are happy to stay and enjoy being here. I suspect that these are the young people who are not only competent in French, but who have started young in activities that take place in French. Young children don't have as many hang-ups or, or don't have the shyness um, that adolescents or young, young adults would have. Um, so, so, there's a solution here, let the young people, let the kids get together, let them play together, encourage them to do it, not let them do it. Uh, involve young teens in co-planning activities. What would a teenager rather do? Something that he or she has thought of, or something that you tell them should do? Easy one, right? Let them um, plan activities that appeal to them. You know, they won't learn colloquial French in the classroom of a French school they will learn it on a soccer field or they will learn it on a hockey rink. And they also get to know each other in authentic situations, which I think is very important. The Francophone perception of Anglophones, there's another perception. There are still myths in the French-speaking community regarding the English speakers. But English speakers are no longer the stereotype West Mountain. The end of the 19th century, yes, the men who lived in the Golden Square Mile, and I say men because it was, the Golden Square Mile, just east of here, where's east? That way? <coughs> east. Controlled, these men controlled three quarters of the wealth of Canada. That's, that's huge, that's amazing. But lower down the hill, there were Anglophones living in um, Point St. Charles, Griffintown, Goose Village, alongside Francophones, all of them in abject poverty. The uh, wealthy businessmen up the hill were equal opportunity exploiters. And this is true to a lesser extent in the regions of the province. It's true that English speakers are still among the highest income, income group in Quebec, but they're also in the lowest income group. And Joanne Pocock has called this the missing middle. It's a, it's a nice expression. This is a graph that I've stolen from Bill Flock, which goes some way to explaining this, 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 these two groups. These, this is the uh, These are anglophones born in Quebec 
And you'll see that if, they, if they've got a doctorate, 64% uh, of them, 66% of them, uh, are likely to have left. I'll just put a line in here. So if you look above the line, you've got uh, some kind of post-secondary education. And in, in, for each of those groups, more than half of them are likely to leave the province, or were likely to have left the province in 2000. They, they have actually left, not likely, they, they're gone. Whereas below the line, you've got um, no high school qualification. And in each of those groups, more than half of the people stay. So you've got the highly educated, uh, presumably wage, high wage earners, and the, the lower educated, uh, lower level wage earners. It's quite dramatic. And, and just, just by comparison, um, for the Retention of francophones born in Quebec. Yes, the numbers are, the numbers are greater for people who stay, but it's flat. There's no there's no cut, cut off line there as I had in the other one. I found that very interesting. Um, so much for the wealthy Anglo's then. It's, uh, there's not many left. <laughs> I was going to say there's not many of them left. <laughs> another, another perception that's perpetrated in Quebec is that Anglophone Quebecers will be responsible for the death of French in the province. Another journalist. And this is despite the fact as we keep hearing that young Quebec Anglos are more and more bilingual, they're the most bilingual in Canada. And that last year the Société Saint-Jean-Baptiste wrote that French is no longer under threat. Well, that did appear in the paper, but it was in very small print. <laughs> and it also ignores a much more pervasive English language influence that doesn't stop at the Quebec border. And I liked uh, calling your expression yesterday uh, the lingua albia that has affected Europe. It's, uh, English is pervasive. It's a worldwide issue. This is a street in Salzburg. If you can't see them, <laughs> quaint little street. Shanghai, can you see it there at the bottom? Yes. Moscow, this is the gum, the famous gum department store in Moscow. And another one from Moscow, even Marks and Spencer gets in on the act. So, you know, I don't feel responsible for this. And I don't feel responsible for the English signs in Quebec either. I, uh, I don't take the blame for that. Um, although, there are some, some of our French colleagues who would blame us for that. So, what's happening in the um, English school system? Um, there's been a precipitous decline in the, in the system. Richard Poulis has talked very eloquently about this, so I won't, uh, uh, I won't repeat what he says. Uh, but between 1971 and 2017, there's been a drop in the school population in English schools of 62%. That's huge. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a declining uh, birth rate that affects both systems. There's, it affects English-speaking community disproportionately because it starts off so much smaller. Law 101, of course, the, the famous exodus, and the allophones going to French schools. I mean, the, the graphs here are amazing because you've got allophones in English schools, the graph goes off a cliff, and allophones in French schools, because of Law 101, just shoots up. It's almost a, which is an asymptote. And of course, the English-speaking parents choosing to send their children to French schools, they feel that um, their own children will learn French, uh, Quebec, Quebecois French and culture, and they'll have a better chance of staying in Quebec with um, good job and career prospects, rather than having them migrate and losing them to the rest of Canada. But Anglophones and Allophones are less likely to get jobs and promotions in Quebec, if you, if you believe the figures, regardless of the quality of your French. And as well, the steady shift of Anglophone children to French schools is an example of 
private individual gain at the cost of collective institutional vitality being suffered by the English school system. And it's no exaggeration to say that the uh, declining enrollment in rural schools is an existential issue. The loss of English education system in rural Quebec is a real possibility. I think we need to think about this very carefully. The decline is so great. The population of the schools have changed so much that we need to think about this, I think. Uh, just take Eastern Shores School Board in the Gas Bay as an example. They have about a 1,000 students <coughs> dispersed across a territory the size of Belgium. Can you imagine trying to govern that, to travel in it, to communicate, to get from the schools on the North Shore to the school board office, but to take a ferry and drive for three hours, or fly to Gaspé and drive for, for three hours? It's not easy. But I, I will say that fortunately for the English speakers in that region, there's uh, strong support from the local organizations um, CASA, Committee for Anglophone Social Action, CAMI, Council for Anglophone Magdalen Islanders. You've heard from them at this forum. And they're, they're very active and very supportive. And they work with the school system. I'm doing this because this is the, the kind of relationship that they have. They're one example. There are others in the province. That's the one I happen to know a little bit better. So what can we do about the decline? Um, Jen, Maureen Jennings, four years ago, three years ago, proposed allowing extra groups of students to enter the English school system. Maureen wasn't the first, her committee wasn't the first to do it, but she proposed quite clearly that English speakers from other provinces of Canada should be allowed into English language schools in Quebec, and that English speaking immigrants from countries where English is the official language, like the States, like the UK, like India, should be allowed into English language schools. It always amazes me that other provinces feel that they're enriched by having French schools in, in their uh, province. Um, their parents, their parents um, come from the rest of Canada, from anywhere in the world, if they speak French, I think in every province, I think I'm right, are allowed to send their children to either French or English school. They have the choice. In Quebec, English-speaking parents don't have that choice if they come from the rest of the world. I think that allowing children from the English-speaking countries to learn French in an English school, alongside English-speaking Quebecers, would be an initiative to persuade young families to stay, to come and to stay. It would help maintain the critical mass of English speakers and to contribute to Quebec society. It would go some way to um, slowing the decline in English schools, although I admit that they're most likely to be concentrated in the urban areas, so this probably wouldn't <coughs> help the rural areas too much. But of course, we're deluding ourselves if we think that there's a political will to change Law 101 and its provisions. The English um, school system and its survival in the regions is going to involve a lot of hard conversations with governments and all interested parties. Um, is there a Quebec government willing to keep an active, engaged, well-educated English community in the rural areas of the province? We'll see. So once they graduate, what happens to them then? The Stats Canada figures that were reported yesterday for the interprovincial mobility rates show that we're a very mobile country, especially the 24 to 34 year olds and especially young Quebec Anglophones. To keep them here, they need jobs, for sure. And what jobs are available to them? Well, not in the public sector, we say over and over, especially in the regions, especially through there. They, whether they're bilingual or not, young people report that they um, find it difficult uh, to, f to find, that young people find it difficult to find support and mentorship and opportunities to um, improve their skills. So we need to encourage them, we need to mentor them. We need to provide things like job shadowing and on um, the job experience and teach the communication <laughs> skills they need. We need more organizations like YES and SEDEC. 
And traditionally, many young people followed their fathers as farmers and fishers in the province. Um, Helena told us that in the Magdalen Islands, 25% of the lobster licenses are owned by English speakers, 6% of the population. But the downside of that is that the youngsters drop out of school to fish for two months. Three, uh, three months? Two. two months, yeah. Um, traditional occupations are, in general, they're in decline. Fishing in the Magdalen Islands is booming at the moment, but is that going to last? Economically, they, they're very vulnerable professions. And besides, they may not be appealing to young people today. Add to that the fact that you have more young women uh, looking for non-traditional jobs and competing in that job market. And um, maybe we should be looking at technical SEJAC programs in the regions to, to help support them. Are these young people going to be educated in their regions, or are they going to leave for Montreal and uh, Quebec City? Experience shows that if they do that, they're less likely to return. There's um, a pervasive sense, and I noticed it before the election, of marginalization of the English sector. We've experienced decades of a lack of political will to support the English speaking community, with exceptions, but in general. One of our guests last year into the board said, we're not an afterthought, we're not even a thought. Which has been depressing. <laughs> I think it's changed, and I think that the Secretariat is doing and will do a lot to um, change that but they are going to need support as well. This is Andre Pratt. So what are we going to do? Are we going to bow to the inevitable? The inevitable decline of failing minority communities as the young and the well-educated and fertile young people follow the global trends and move to the urban areas, or for many of the well-educated bilingual people to the rest of Canada and the rest of the world, where they become the elite. If you're well-educated and bilingual in Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary, you're treated very well. Do we decide, though, that these small English-speaking communities aren't worth saving? Do we decide that the English language school system isn't worth saving and protecting? Or do we decide what we value, what we've inherited, and protect, preserve, and promote what we decide is worth preserving? You know my answer on that, clearly. But if we do this, what do we base the decision on? There's such diversity among English communities that uh, there isn't one solution, there isn't one answer. One size doesn't fit all. And to plug the advisory board again, we wrote a brief call of that a few years ago. We can't depend on the churches, which are in decline. We can't depend on an empathetic government in Quebec City. We hope for it, but we can't depend on it. Nor on an influx of industry into the regions. We live beside a majority population that feels threatened by the ocean of English that surrounds it in North America, and we understand this, we get it. French speakers fear the loss of their language. We get it, we've responded to it. We are a minority population within the minority, and we've taken measures to adapt to this reality. We're very versatile as a, as a group, and very uh, adaptable. We're not the angry phones of the 1980s. Our children are taking more classes in French than they are in English, and often in French language schools, as we've said. And they are making the efforts to become bilingual. And I, I will say, polls conducted by the Journal de Montréal and the crocodile tears of its journalists for the poor people in Westmount and the, the pampered minority, they're very unhelpful, to say the least. How do we fix this? How do we promote the fait anglais in the English, uh, in, the, in the, um, the French surroundings, in the French press? Who are our spokespeople? 
asking a lot of questions, obviously. The crucial question behind all this, I think, though, is, the, is where's the leadership in the English community? Who are our leaders? We no longer have a critical mass of MNAs in the National Assembly. There's no obvious leader, either individually or as a power group. How long would it take us to mobilize sufficiently to develop a cohesive, coordinated voice in defense of community vitality for the English speakers in Quebec? We're very lucky to have the Quebec Community Groups Network as an umbrella for many of the English-speaking interest groups in the province, but they can't do everything, and they can't do it alone. And we're very delighted, of course, to have the Secretariat, but again, they may need our support as the days go by to prove their usefulness, I think was the word that was used in the lead up to the election. Usefulness. <laughs> the, um, can I flick through this one? I'm not gonna worry about that one. <coughs> this was a, a Senate of Canada um, report in 2011, and I, I believe this. I believe that a vibrant English public school system leads to a greater English community vitality. That's why I'm here at this conference, because I believe this. And the school year may form the, the, the focal point for the community, but its human and financial resources are stretched as it is. The English system is always taking the grassroots, bottom-up approach to education and community enterprises, but at present there are so many great initiatives and there are too many, too many agencies working in silos. Look around you, listen to what you've heard in the last two days, look at the program for this forum. There are so many good things going on. This forum, and I congratulate the, um, the forum organizers, it's a way of bringing this together. We're able to talk to each other, we're able to share. And that's the, that I think is a key, this notion of cooperation is, is key. In the English communities in Quebec, we need harmonized initiatives among all English-speaking services and the French-speaking services. We're too small to go it alone. Many of the issues that, that we've described that we face are the same as those facing the, the French-majority speakers, and cooperation between all the groups is crucial. Um, some of the school boards have made moves to share services to improve efficiency and to reduce costs. And the director generals have, uh, the directors general, sorry, have cautioned us that uh, there are the governance differences between the two systems that cause some problems, and so we need care in this. So I'll just finish with one thought that gives me gives me hope. I'm very excited about the young leaders that are emerging from our communities. You've heard many of them in the past two days. They're the result of a successful education system, and they and their life can have a huge impact on our society, and specifically on our English-speaking communities. But just as I talked about the missing middle in, in earnings in the province, I think there's a missing middle here in leadership. Um, I, I will be bold enough to say there's a lot of gray hair in this room, but there are a lot of young people as well. It's that gap in the middle that we need to, to think about. I think that the, the elders, as the indigenous people say, have a responsibility to mentor and to encourage the new generation of young leaders, but they can't do it alone either. In the same way that the education system can't do it alone and can't take sole responsibility for rejuvenating the communities. Maintaining community vitality and, main and maintaining English language schools that function symbiotically with the communities will take a harmonized combination of well-educated bilingual people attractive and appropriate local job opportunities, education appropriate to the needs of the local job market through school and Sejap and university, institutional support from agencies at the local and provincial level, and action based on a clear definition of what's worth preserving. 
All this led by energetic young people with their own clear vision of community values. Is this too much to ask? Thank you. history curriculum with refusal to engage on this issue from the English school boards. Would you like to address the top one? All right, I'll no. repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> you did say you didn't want to talk about politics. Right? Would you like to, oh, let's try one from the audience. Then. No, let's throw it out to you. Yeah, that's what I would say. You know more about the history program than I do. My name is Roma Medwin. I'm the former Deputy Director General of the English Montreal School Board and currently with Concordia. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that the English School Boards didn't do anything about the issue. Um, in fact, one of the top consultants from the school boards, um, Tony B Bordenero, did appear at Parliamentary Commission with QESBA. And uh, we did present the issues that were lacking in the history curriculum. And there's been a lot of lobbying by the um, chairs of the school boards. So I'm not sure um, the direction where that question is coming from, but I can assure you there was a lot of work done to change the content of that curriculum before it came out. And it's, they're, they're constantly working on it because there are pilot projects that were in place and the feedback was given to the ministry. Uh, Brian, I w I'm not going to cop out completely on this. Um, <laughs> I, I will just say that um, the curriculum is what's written on a piece of paper and what's examined at the end of the, the year, talking about history. What, what actually happens in the classroom is what the teacher decides to do. And I think that a lot of teachers, sorry I should stand, a lot of teachers are doing a heck of a good job in, in supplementing this curriculum and in teaching the bits that are missing. I say that because the teachers that I've spoken to would be teachers in the English school system. My, my concern is that the, let me, let me just nail the community here. The teachers in Lac Saint-Jean probably aren't going to be doing the same thing. And there will be a gap in the knowledge of those youngsters in, in what the history of the province is really like. Thank you. Uh, I'm Cindy Finn. I'm past president of LCEQ and at the time that the ministry was undertaking that revision of the history curriculum, we did submit a brief with a lot of cautions and suggestions. Um, but I will, and so, you know, although we, we always can agree there could be a better curriculum that's more inclusive and more representative of different perspectives, what Kate says reflects what our teachers tell us uh, in our school boards that although it is not perfect there are things that they do like about it and they will introduce but the one fact that we cannot get away from is that as long as there are ministry-based exams requiring a certain understanding of history from a certain perspective those teachers are held hostage to that exam so although we encourage inclusive perspectives the anglophone contributions the indigenous contributions if a teacher's going to invest a lot of time in doing that, it's worthwhile in the classroom, but when you're faced up against that exam at the end of the year where there may be one question, two questions, you, you can understand there's a pragmatic need to make sure you cover a very dense curriculum. So we have a lot of work to do to continue that dialogue, but I agree with my colleague Roma that it's not that we loved it, it's just there are certain realities and we need to continue to work within. It's an improvement from perhaps what was before, but we have a long way to go to continue to improve uh, that curriculum to reflect the Anglophone reality. Hi, Lorraine O'Donnell from Questron. Um, I find this discussion about, the particular discussion about the history curriculum uh, we tend to be foci focusing it on schools. Um, I would invite us to consider the broader question of where is the teaching going on at the CEGEP and university levels. Uh, Brendan O'Donnell, no relation to me, gave a, 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 a very um, impassioned 
talk yesterday, and um, on our Quest Grin website, we have a tape of him having done that at a previous event we hosted about the decline of studies of English Quebec at the university level. Uh, Concordia has been fantastic in supporting our initiative here, but there's work to be done too between schools, CEGEPs, and universities around transmission of culture, heritage, and history at those levels as well. I should just mention, if you're not familiar with Brendan O'Donnell's work, it can be accessed on the Question website, and it's a wonderful collection of resources on the <laughs> invaluable. Good morning, Aina Osborne from Literal School Board. I think we limit ourselves if we look at um, ensuring that the English language community in Quebec is addressed within the school system only by looking at it from a history perspective. I think we have to focus on looking at a cross-curricular approach, arts, it all the different courses to make sure that there are opportunities for our youth and, and the teachers to, to look at those aspects. So it's time to go back to the uh, screen. How can urban schools, this is addressed to you, how can urban schools better support rural schools? There are initiatives that have taken place <coughs> to um, um, what you call them, school visits. Sorry. I need to stand up. Uh, school visits. Um, I mean, Central Quebec had a, a lovely um, project some years ago, and Chad, you can keep me honest on this one, where they had basketball tournaments with the um, uh, indigenous schools on the Cree community in Disney, was it, or uh, Shetterville, sorry. Um, and that was, that was so valuable. The kids got to know each other, they got to share, they played basketball, I and mean, they all liked that, right? So that was, that was an authentic situation again. It's hugely expensive. It's very, very expensive to ship these youngsters. They were billeted, so that, I guess that didn't add too much to the cost, but it's, it's something that can be done and should be done, but it's a question of paying for it. And if you've been following, if you've got youngsters in the system, you'll know that um, there's been a great um, cap placed on the amount of fees that parents can pay. Um, this, this has affected all sorts of things. It's affected the, um, the arts community because Geordie Theatre Productions, for example, isn't being invited to put on productions for kids because the schools can't afford to take the kids to the productions, to the shows. So it's always come down to cost. It's a horrible thing to say, but that's always a major factor. Can they do it? Yes. And they can do it between the French and the English systems, too. But um, again, you know, you've got a territory where you've got eight French schools and one English school. Everyone's going to be spread pretty thin in that English school. And that relates to the, the, the first question up there, the collaboration. If you've got a, a, sm a small English school board, you're, you're Let's say director of complementary studies, uh, complementary <laughs> services. services. Thank you. Is going to be serving on all sorts of committees. That person's going to be spread pretty thin. Whereas in the in the, the surrounding French school boards or schools, the people are, there's enough people to man these various committees. So there are there are problems with scale. There are problems with money. They're not insurmountable. Somebody with a little bit of initiative is going to be able to do this. The CLCs can, can provide um, a venue for this too. Um, if they're based in the community, they can encourage cooperation and sharing as well. So there are ways of doing it, but it's not obvious. It's not, uh, it's not going to be that easy. Would you like to go on to address that first question further? Or? Um, I, I, again, I get this from one director general specifically who said that um, he made a move to share the transportation between his school board and the surrounding French school boards, plural, because again, his territory was large and there were a 
I think there were three French school boards on the same territory. So, you know, the buses over here could provide transportation for um, the, the English kids and, and the French kids, and so could the buses over there in that region from, from that school board, that French school board, all on the same English school board territory. But the calendars were different. The time that the schools were opening was different. Uh, the pet days were different. Again, it's not insurmountable, but it all takes work, it all takes effort, and it needs somebody with the energy to, to put in the effort to make it work. By the way, if there are other answers, please interrupt me and, and jump in, because I think this should be where we share our uh, ideas. I studied this Brown from uh, John Abbott College on the Dean of Technology, and I want to address the issue of collaboration in the first question. Uh, we are involved in high fidelity simulation training of nurses, something that's very expensive. And uh, recently, the director, the collaboration from the ministry level all the way down to the faculty level has occurred around this. The Ministry of Education and Health got together and put money on the table and asked the director generals to contribute money to a center of simulation tra training in East End Montreal. It was quite difficult to arrange that and in some, to some degree the director generals took a gamble doing that because they didn't know if it would work. And among our faculty in, at Vanier College and Do uh, John Abbott College, there was some trepidation that the needs of the English speaking faculty and students wouldn't be uh, adequately addressed by the center. So what we did is we communicated very early what our needs were and a little bit, I won't say aggressively, but strongly to, because we were worried that we wouldn't be overlooked. I have to say that the Francophone uh, administrators of that center and the Francophone faculty have, have responded very, very well and things are going well. There's a high level of satisfaction that I'm hearing from the faculty. Gloria Jarramillo, the coordinator of our nursing program, might have more details about that. She's sitting right in front of me. But uh, one of the things you need to do is be confident that you have something to offer the partner. And one thing we have to offer, besides the expertise we have, which was slightly different, is the English language, which is very important in the training of nurses, even for Francophone nurses. And you need to be able to communicate strongly what the other people have, the collaborators have, that you need. And in this case, it wasn't just pooled resources, it was French, because our nursing students need to improve their French so that they can work in healthcare. And so there's a kind of um, mutual benefit that is emerging, and it's a very, very successful project to date. Uh, we hope it continues to be successful. So I think you need to really communicate clearly and identify people of good faith on the other side, and they will respond. Thank you, Michael Murray from the Eastern Township School Board. And just to endorse what Kate was saying, it is entirely possible We've been do joint busing for approximately 20 years with uh, one French school board on our territory. Others have become interested and are, uh, we are in negotiations to share busing with them. And en passant, we also bus for the private schools on our territory. Uh, the problems of aligning uh, pet days and calendars and that sort of thing have taken a lot of energy. But when you decide to do it, it's very doable and the advantages are enormous. We now have a joint school, elementary school that runs in French and English uh, entirely with a single principal presiding over both halves of the school and only instruction is segregated. Sports, athletics, uh, meal times, busing is all integrated. It makes a huge difference. Uh, our, the kids out of that school speak uh, flawless French, flawless English as well on the French, for the French kids. <coughs> and very often uh, can't really distinguish which language they're talking, just happens to be the one that comes out of their mouth. Uh, that kind of approach is what we need to do and to endorse what was said by, by uh, was it Ben Yee or, or, or John Abbott. Um, you need to have the confidence that you can do something and work with the people to allay their fears because they're a lot more afraid of us than we are of them, you know, the, the communities that, that uh, we share services with, the parents are very concerned about losing their Frenchness uh, by too much exposure to, I don't know, English juice or whatever. So you have to reassure them that they will be able to retain 
their language and their culture, even if their kids ride on a bus and go to a school and share sports with uh, Anglophone kids. Once you overcome that initial reserve, uh, everybody endorses the advantages, uh, which are multiple. Uh, I think also it may be why in Eastern Township School Board, uh, for the fifth consecutive year, we have a growing uh, in enrollment in regions. So unlike the example, extreme example of Eastern Shores, which Kate used, uh, we have a much more robust approach to sustaining our schools, maintaining them. We have uh, recently been awarded an expansion of a school. We're bidding actively for a brand new school in Drummondville. Those are not indicators of a community or a service in decline, uh, but quite the opposite. And, and I think it's all a question of attitude rather than um, you know, being defensive about a, a, a uh, lack of collaboration. Do it. Uh, being concerned about the history books, like Doris Holt has said, uh, our educators said it's not a good course, but it's better than what we had, so let's use it and keep on uh, uh, advocating for improvements and uh, keep on uh, looking for new ways to, to leverage our assets by collaborating with other people in the region. Uh, Jessica Sinnott, uh, Director of Vision Gas Big Bursa Now. Uh, mine is more of a comment. Uh, when I saw this last uh, question come up, I had been wanting to mention that uh, my own children, are English schools providing the same opportunities that French schools are, uh, uh, we started them out in French school. Um, and then recently this year, we switched them to the English elementary school. And I wanted to say that it, the difference is huge. There is so much more going on. Our schedules are so full, <laughs> which is great. There's so much more going on in the English school than there was in their French school. And one of the comments uh, from my eight-year-old son on the reason that he loves his new school so much is that he can speak English. Because when he was in his French school, they're so strict that even during recess, they don't want them speaking English. They want them speaking French. Um, so it was just that comment to, to, to say that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use the prerogative of having the microphone and ask my own question, which I wrote down during your talk. I think you know, I want to open this up a little differently. So some have argued, and in fact, you did this well, that we're moving into the era of Anglophone 2.0. Uh, the Anglophone bilingual perfectly capable, willing to live in French, to navigate in French, to work in French. So in this context, this perplexes me. Does this mean our institutions are less important and less valuable in the context of the Anglophone point zero? To, to, to these young people you want just to? To the Anglophone community in general. This is something we should really be still I would like the argument to see why we should be so concerned about it. I, I'm a bit concerned, sorry. I, I, I'm a bit concerned about that in that my, my children, and now big children, they've grown up and have children their own. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about it personally. Should we be concerned as a community? Um, well, we're, you know, it's not just the, um, the French speakers in this province who are influenced by McDonald's and Starbucks and Tommy Hilfiger and so on. We all are. We're all. Uh, who, who, who's the first name on the news every day? Yeah. Um, we are. We're all influenced by external in, well, influences. I believe the same word again. Um, should we be concerned? What, what's worth preserving? What, we've got to decide this, I think. I think that's my problem, is deciding, you know, where is the history? You know, you take the gas bay, and I, I'm sorry to keep coming back there, but it's, it's close to my, my heart. Um, the, do you know the, the oldest retail company in Canada? Hudson's Bay. Do you know the second oldest? Robin Jones and Whitman. Uh, fishery in the in the gas bay. It's no longer exists, but it was funded. It's the second oldest in Canada. 
How many of you knew that? I know this isn't a quiz. <laughs> yeah, some did, not many. Uh, our kids don't know that. Is it important? Eh, maybe not. But it's part of the heritage. It's part of the. It's part of the uh, cultural heritage, economic heritage, whatever you want to call it. Should we be concerned about it? I'll throw it out to you. Does it matter? It does bother me a little bit, but I don't know how you feel about that. So that would be the subject of a very interesting conference in itself. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any time left, but I don't want to end on my question, so we'll take one more. Hi, my name is Nina Kim and I'm from CEDEC. Um, I just had a comment with regards to how urban schools can better support rural schools. In my opinion, um, what we need to do is work as a community so that the school educational system works with community institutions, uh, community organizations to promote the vitality. One thing that CEDEC did in 2012 uh, to show an example of this uh, for the schools was we went to the South Shore and we did something called artworks. We worked in collaboration with the CLC. We turned something that was supposed to be a 120 um, participant event to over 700 students in one day and the budget didn't increase. What we did was we brought on private sectors to support funding. Um, we had four different schools bust in from the different regions. So they paid for their, out of their discretionary funds, just the busing portion. The artists were paid honorariums. We had over 30 artists, 720 kids flowing through over about 70 workshops, and it was all collaborative. And at the end of it, it was really an intersectoral, um, intersectoral, intergenerational, inter intercommunity approach where it was educational institutions, community organizations, um, with CEDEC being the interlocutor, but it was it was workforce development while entrepreneurship was there, where education was there, and everything was combined. I think when we limit ourselves to just thinking about education in a silo, we're looking at a very narrow scope and very narrow lens. Once we have a forum where we can discuss the different elements combined working together, I think we'll have a much more fruitful approach. What a great way to end, because I mentioned CEDEC, and what a, what a wonderful up note to finish on. Sorry, Brian, I'm not sharing this. Oh, no, yeah. no Charlene Sullivan, uh, neighbors representing the Evans region, and that question is my question, I asked. Uh -huh. and, and I love all the answers I heard, but I want to leave you with the thought is, I was thinking more in smaller things, supplies, books, leftover uh, sports equipment that you have in the bigger schools where we don't have a budget. So I love everything I heard, don't get me wrong, but we can really tone it down. There's little things that we need that could be of a great help also. So please join me in thanking Kate.